Well, I'm talking about storms, but someone asked me a question the other day about why the Coriolis force is opposite in the two hemispheres. And I can't give you a complete explanation, but I can give you a partial explanation. Um, here's the globe, and of course, it's, it spins towards the east, right? Sun rises in the east, sets in the west. So that's the way the Earth spins. If I keep spinning it in that direction, and I face this towards you, is that clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. I'm going to sp keep spinning it in that direction. Is that clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. clockwise. So in a sense, while the globe spins eastward, the sense of rotation is opposite in the two hemispheres. And that is one way to understand why the Coriolis force is opposite in the two hemispheres. So like I say, not a complete explanation, but I think, but it's true. And I think it's, uh, it helps to understand that tricky point about the, uh, about the Coriolis force. Any questions on that? OK, so we're going through storms today. This is not very quantitative material. Uh, this stuff will be posted after the fact. And your textbook is very good. These chapters that I've assigned, a number, a number of them have to do with storm types and so on. So you'll find a good, uh, of course, I will explain things somewhat differently, but you'll find a good way to get uh, competing views of this by listening to what I say and then reading the textbook. And between the two, you should, you should come out pretty well on this subject. Um, so we were um, talking about convective storms. And that is the class of storms that get their energy from the release of latent heat. I mentioned this last time. That's a number that I carry around in my head. Well, it's rounded off a little bit. But I use that number so often that I carry it around in my head. The latent heat of condensation, or if you like, the latent heat of evaporation, it's the same magnitude, depend or independent of whether you're condensing or evaporating water, is about 2.5 million joules per kilogram. And uh, so when you condense water, you're, you're then providing extra heat to the air, which makes it warmer, more buoyant. It's likely to rise then. And that's what's going on in all, in all of these storms. It's the basic underlying energy source. We talked about air mass thunderstorms last time and how they go through a life cycle. And uh, after they take about 20 minutes to 30 minutes to develop from a fair weather cumulus into a, a cumulonimbus with rain coming out the bottom. And then as the rain begins, you begin to get some evaporation of falling rainwater just below cloud base. That produces cool air, which then sinks and spreads out. It's like you open your, your freezer door, and that cold air from the freezer falls down to the kitchen floor and then spreads out. That's what's happening. And that's, uh, that goes by various names. Sometimes we call it a, uh, a downburst. Sometimes it's called a, uh, a gust front. The front of it is called the gust front. But anyway, the air is now spreading out away from the cloud, and that shuts off the warm, moist inflow. Uh, so it kills itself off, basically. It has a, after about two hours, it's gone. Now, that outflow might well trigger another thunderstorm. So that doesn't mean, for example, over the state of Connecticut on a day when there are thunderstorms, it doesn't mean there's just going to be one and then none. It means there'll be one, and then as it dies, it may trigger two others. And then as they die, they may trigger others. So this may go on throughout the afternoon. But the individual cells have a short lifetime. That's an important characteristic. As opposed to <coughs> these severe storms, um, which have the additional environmental factor of having wind shear through the, tropos uh, th through the troposphere, usually a jet stream aloft. Strong winds near the tropopause, weak winds near the surface of the Earth. That tends to bend the storm over and change its structure into one in which the inflow is at a different location than the outflow caused by that evaporative cooling. In fact, 
the cold, cold air generated by evaporative cooling spreads out and actually forms a gust front over which the warm air then lifts. So it actually assists in the lifting of the warm air up into the cloud. And this structure is more or less stable and can persist for a number of hours, in some, some cases even for even overnight. And these are the ones that have all, they're, they're larger and they're severe in every way you can imagine. I think I showed these last time. But heavy rains and flooding, hail, lightning, tornadic winds. I don't think the um, low pressure in the tornado is much of an issue, but the gust front winds coming from that cool air uh, is another source of wind damage. In, many, in some cases, that causes more damage than even a tornado could. Usually the, the tornadic winds are stronger when there is a tornado, but the gust front winds may cover a wider area and in some cases will cause more damage than, the, than a possible tornado. Um, I don't know if I got this far, but here's a picture of one. And earlier in the course, we talked about the visual appearance of a, of a funnel. And this is called the condensation funnel. That is basically um, a cloud composed of tiny liquid water droplets um, that's produced when air from outside moves in and drops its pressure. The pressure inside a, um, a tornado is much lower than in the surrounding atmosphere, so that air that moves in there is going to expand, not by moving vertically, but by moving into the tornado, it'll expand, cool, and you can form a cloud. And that's what you're seeing. In fact, you often see this descending from cloud base. The cloud base will appear to be flat, and then as, a, as the tornado develops, that funnel cloud will, will descend to the ground. When you see that, it's more natural to understand that it's really like a cloud, because it's actually an extension of that cloud reaching down to the surface. Whereas this other thing here is the debris funnel. That's stuff that's been kicked up uh, by the high winds at the surface. And that's not water. That's usually dirt or soil or cows or cars or houses and things like that. Um, and here again, you see the condensation funnel and you see a, a debris funnel around that. Lightning comes along with that. And of course, these Sparks of electricity is what you hear as thunder. And I think you know that, I'm sh how many know the, how to compute in your mind how far a storm is? Do you know that trick? It's pretty simple because you assume that the light that comes from the lightning strike travels to your eye at the speed of light, which is, you might say, instantaneous, right? Um, whereas the sound that reaches your ear moves at the speed of sound, which is something like 300 meters per second. And so if you simply, when you see a lightning flash, if you then count out the number of seconds, one second, two seconds, so for every second delay between the two, that's 300 meters of distance. So if it was three seconds delayed, uh, that would be 900 meters or about a kilometer away from you. So that's an easy calculation to do, realizing that the thunder is produced by the, by the lightning itself. You suddenly heat that air with the, the electrical discharge. It expands suddenly, produces a, an acoustic signal that then travels to your ear, and you recognize that as, as, um, as thunder. Questions on that? Hailstones. Um, because there's a lot of supercooled water above the freezing line in those storms and very strong updraft motions that can suspend particles while they grow by rhyming. And eventually, when either that updraft weakens or the object becomes too large, it'll then fall out of the sky. And it's too large to melt. I, I told you many times that a snowflake will melt as it passes down through the freezing level and become a raindrop. But if I've got a chunk of, of ice that's five centimeters across and it falls down, it's too big. It's going to take minutes uh, to melt. And by that time, it'll be at the surface. So it'll be, a, it'll be wet. It'll have a wet outer surface, but it'll still be a solid chunk of ice when it falls to earth. 
and hits. Um, this is thunderstorm frequency across the United States, number of thunderstorms per year. Now, I've told you that these are called, most of these are just air mass thunderstorms. They're not so damaging. Um, and it looks like Florida is the capital for um, air mass thunderstorms. You get 100 of them per year. Other areas get far less. Um, but these aren't the severe ones. I'll show you the severe ones in just a moment. You don't get many thunderstorms in the West Coast because the, uh, there's too strong an inversion there. There's a tend Normally, you get with the cold water off the coast from the California current, the atmosphere over here is just too stable, too many inversions to get uh, thunderstorms forming in that part of the world. So it really is kind of an East Coast phenomenon, but it starts right at the Rocky Mountain front here in Colorado, and you find storms then pretty much all the way to the east, including all the way up into Canada, you get quite a few. Now I don't uh, often in this course talk about the research that goes on in, in here at Yale or in, in my group, but I wanted to show you one thing. Uh, I had a PhD student who finished a couple years ago who tried to understand the timing of thunderstorms uh, from west to east across in a region generally like this. And so she looked at a lot of, of uh, climate of rainfall data from the summer months and came up with a diagram like this. Now I'm going to explain this. It's going to take a minute just to figure out what in the heck is plotted here. But on this axis is longitude, so it's distance east-west, uh, basically through a region something like this. So it's a distance east-west in, in a latitude belt, something like that. And um, on this axis is the local solar time. So instead of actually using time zones, which are kind of an artificial construct, right? You make arbitrary choices about where to switch from eastern time to central time to mountain time. This is just local time. Basically, how high is the sun in the sky? That determines what this clock would be. And then contoured is the precipitation rate, the hourly precipitation rate. So from this diagram, for any given latitude, if you scan up, you'll find how much it rains at different hours of the day. Now, we did repeat. We plotted everything twice. So you've got 0 to 24 and then 24 to 48. But if you notice, the plot just repeats as well. So we've just put the, the same data on there twice, which makes it a little bit easier to go through a full day's cycle. You can start at any hour you want and go 24 hours ahead. So this is the Rocky Mountain front. This is where a lot of thunderstorms form. It's over in here. And um, those storms tend to form uh, between 12 and 1800. So that's in the afternoon, local solar time. Now that's not a surprise, right? Because pr one of the most important triggers for thunderstorms is the heating of the sun, of the earth by the sun. So it's in the afternoon when you've built up this deep convective boundary layer by heating the surface of the earth. And finally, that heating is going to generate cumulus clouds and they'll then grow to form cumulonimbus. So it's not surprising that you find storms beginning there. And over the East Coast, here in Connecticut, for example, you also find that the storms form in the afternoon due to the heating of the earth by the sun. But look what happens in this middle territory, which is um, basically this very large region through here. That has some other kind of a trigger because, look, that is advancing in time. As I move eastward, the time of day when thunderstorms um, occur is 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the evening, midnight, 3 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock the next morning, and so on. So you've got something that is departing from the simple idea of the sun as the driving force. What this turns out to be is a disturbance that's generated each day over the Rocky Mountains and then is, whoops, wrong direction, and then is pushed eastwards by the westerly winds. And this, uh, it's a warm air disturbance generated over the mountains. And as it drifts eastward and move aloft, it triggers thunderstorms as it moves along. I had somebody in my office a couple weeks ago, uh, a scientist who 
grew up in one of these states and always wondered why there they had a maximum thunderstorm frequency in the middle of the night. Who would expect that? Doesn't seem to fit with the standard thermal solar forcing idea. Well, this is why. In this case, my student discovered that it's a disturbance generated over the Rockies that moves eastward and gives that progressive timing uh, to the thunderstorms. Then you get east of the um, Appalachian Mountains and you get back to a more normal uh, mid-afternoon thunderstorm maxima. Any questions on that? What are those dotted lines? Uh, I think they're reference lines for some other figure in the paper that's not shown here. So the, the, there are sloping lines that are drawn in here at different speeds. Since this is distance versus time, a slope represents a propagation speed, 30 meters per second, 14 meters per second, 7 meters per second. These disturbances move eastward at about 14 meters per second, bringing those thunderstorms progressively later as you move towards the east. Yes? No, that was, uh, that's not shown in this figure, but that was actually, there was some hint about this progression already from, from radar data, but she confirmed it using uh, surface data, and then she discovered this warm air pulse aloft that was doing the triggering. That was the, th that was the, the point of her thesis, yeah. Anything else on that? So now let's get to the severe thunderstorms, and the way I'll get at that is just to show you this tornado frequency map. And of course, it looks a bit different. There is a maximum in Florida, but it's smaller. Uh, and the big maximum is over Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. And of course, this is what's called uh, tornado alley by some people, right? You've heard that expression. It's kind of the region. So what, what's special about this region, apparently, and by the way, this, is, this maximizes in the spring. So typically, this is an April-May phenomenon. If, you're gonna, if you have watched any of these shows about chasing tornadoes, and if you want to do that, then schedule your trip in April and May, because that's when, that's when things get exciting out there. And um, what's special about this region is that you get some warm, moist air moving in from the Gulf of Mexico at low levels. And then you get the jet stream coming across the Rocky Mountains at high levels. And that gives you the shear that you need. And you've got the moisture because you've got the high temperatures and high humidities in the low levels. So all the ingredients are kind of there. Not every day. It fluctuates from day to day. But generally, that's the reason why this area is so special. And as far as I know, there's no other place on Earth that has as many, has a high a tornado frequency as this region does. So this is kind of special even if you look globally. There are a few other places in Asia and in Australia where they get this phenomena, but this is kind of the most frequent place for it to, um, to occur. Questions there? Anybody from, anybody from Tornado Alley? Anybody live in these states? Not at all? You're all East Coast or West Coast people? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, for example, I read a paper once about this one who tr tried to claim there was something special about the terrain in that region. But to be honest with you, I would doubt the statistical significance of something like that. Unless I really had seen a very rigorous statistical analysis, I would wonder whether these spots are really realistic uh, or whether they're just a fluke of what, you know, you had one or two events there and by random chance that happened to look like a little maxima or something like that. So I wouldn't try to put too much significance on those. Whether that, that, uh, that may be distinct from this one, I think a case could be made there. Uh, but I, and I'm, not, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why there would be two maxima there. We do get them in, in uh, Connecticut as well, not frequently, but every few years we get a tornado that comes down through the state, can cause quite a bit of damage. Um, but it's a, like a ratio of 7 to 1 or 9 to 1 in terms of the relative frequency of those two things. Now, um, so before we leave the subject, I want to give you a little bit of a sense for what a tornado is like. And here's a picture from May 2007, the 
the uh, devastation in Greensburg, Kansas, really a whole town was, isn't that horrible? I mean, it's just everything wiped out. And the only way I could think of, and this is going to be, take a couple of minutes and maybe a little bit boring, we'll see, but I want to show you what, what, the, what the news was saying at this point. So this is, um, This is the radar, the, the Doppler radar. I'll explain why that's important in just a minute. Blue, red. service in this part of Kansas, uh, but once again you see a very strong, very well pronounced hook echo in addition to the very strong velocity return. That's the hook echo in right there. The of Greensburg to the south. I really suggest you go down to your storm shelter. I said I'm not an alarmist kind of guy, but the only thing this storm is uh, very scary and the worst case, I'm just going to waste a little bit of your time tonight if you go down to your shelters and it turns out not to be producing a tornado, but uh, just what we're seeing here is a very scary signature. Andy, how close are you to the county line? Uh, we have passed the county line already, Jay. Okay, so you're north of the county line, and the tornado, from your advantage point, is to the east of US 183, oh. correct? Jay, very large tornado. Okay, I don't know who reported it to which. We, do. we have two tornadoes on the ground, Jay. Uh, we have a small, uh, well, excuse me, a medium, if you will, to, the, to my north, northeast. We have a very large, very large wedge tornado on the ground. It's going to be mm -hmm. almost due yeah. north of my location. I'm going to put it about five miles, Jay, about five miles, I'm guessing, All right. uh, north, maybe five to eight miles north of my location right now, Jay. All right, Landy, try and get in the first camp fired up if you can, and now let's go over to Darren. Darren, what do you see from your vantage point? Uh, right now, we're uh, just about ready to get on the Highway 183 to go north towards Greensburg. Um, we still have a large wedge tornado on the ground uh, to our north with possible satellite tornadoes. Um, yeah, I just saw a lightning flash that... Uh, so, um, probably, I would say probably five miles to our north uh, is where the tornado would be located, and it has been on the ground for probably uh, 25 minutes, maybe even longer. See, it's, uh, mo it's, it's moving in that direction. Uh, what cross street? How far north of the Kiowa Comanche County line are you? Uh, we're right on the line. You're right on the line currently, and you're about to proceed northbound back behind the tornado. That's correct. And you've been watching this for quite a little while, and what did you estimate its maximum width was? Um, I would say easily a mile, um, and that's kind of being conservative. Uh, before that, we had uh, two separate uh, mesocyclones uh, with uh, looks to be a cone tornado, and then uh, off to our east, probably a uh, quarter to half mile was a uh, snow pipe tornado. Uh, a lot of power flashes with that. All right, Darren, I know you've. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop that there for a minute. Um, well, I guess I'll stop it there anyway, but the. Um, the two things I wanted to point out to you. So he's got two things he's looking at. He's got the radar, and uh, he's looking at the reflectivity, which is telling you where the rain is falling. And in that, he's finding this shape, which is called the hook echo. So there's rain falling through here, and the spin up in the cloud is wrapping this rain shaft around in a kind of a spiral. And that's a very clear signature of a very strong cyclone aloft. Then he's also got the Doppler for the same instrument, the same radar. It measures the, um, the uh, frequency of the reflected radar beam. And uh, they know what frequency they sent out. If it comes back a higher frequency, that means the air at that location is moving towards you. If it comes back at a lower frequency, it's moving away from you. This is the Doppler effect, right? When it, when a, 
car goes by or a train goes by, you hear that, you know, as it's coming towards you and then going away from you, there's that frequency shift. And what he was showing were these two regions, one was red and one was blue, indicating in one region the wind is away from you, in the other region it's toward you. So uh, it probably was like this, if the radar was down here, which means there is a cyclone, right? On this side of its move, you're not, fine, you're not measuring this other component, you're just measuring a component towards and away from the radar, but when you see that doublet, that, that uh, velocity away from you and velocity towards you, there's only, really only one explanation for that. There's a tight vortex right in there up in the cloud, and uh, very possibly that's causing a, a tornado at the ground. So um, what's nice about that, that film loop is that's not after the fact, that's during the effect. So he's putting himself on the line and saying, listen, I know sometimes we have false alarms about these things, but this is one of the strongest signatures I've ever seen. So he's putting out that kind of warning to the people. It's pretty, uh, you have to take some guts to do that because occasionally they do get this wrong. Um, okay, so we're going to continue, and I think that's, yeah, so that's all we have on severe thunderstorms. Are there any, any questions on severe thunderstorms before we go on to another subject? Okay, so um, you can read about it in this book. It's fascinating stuff, and um, we'll turn to hurricanes. Now, a few basic bullet points about hurricanes. As with uh, other convective storms, they get their energy from latent heat release. Um, in this case, they get that water vapor directly from the ocean. So um, it doesn't, you don't use up the water vapor in the atmosphere as a tornado begins to draw on it because with a warm ocean, you can evaporate water from the ocean just as fast as you're drawing it up in the storm. So in one way, it's better to say that really it's the warm ocean that provides the fuel for this, um, but yet it's also water vapor. The warm water evaporates, uh, and then you get the water vapor that goes up into the cloud, and as it rises, you get the latent heat release and the buoyancy and so on and so forth. Now. Um, if you have too much wind shear, this is just the opposite <laughs> of the severe thunderstorm. Right? Severe thunderstorms require that wind shear to distort it and give it that severe condition. Whereas hurricanes out over the ocean, if you have a lot of wind shear, they will not form. They're a symmetric kind of uh, deal, and if you try to shear that off, you'll just destroy it. So you need a lot of warm ocean water and not very much shear, and then you can... Uh, under some conditions, you can generate um, a hurricane. They cannot form at the equator because they have to spin one way or the other, and uh, they get that cue from the Coriolis force. And so if there's no Coriolis force, you cannot form a hurricane. So they cannot form at the equator, and as I mentioned today, they cannot even cross the equator. Once they've formed in one hemisphere, they've got to stay in that hemisphere. They can't suddenly decide to wander across to the other hemisphere. They couldn't exist with the spin that they have. Um, they do spin oppositely in the two hemispheres. The, just like in the tornado, the pressure is very low in the center, and that balances the, uh, uh, the Coriolis force and the centripetal force of the air spinning around the outside. So this is a cyclone in the same sense that I defined cyclone for you the other day. It's a low pressure center with um, air currents moving around it in the cyclonic direction. That is counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, clockwise in the southern hemisphere. They occur in the late summer and early fall in both hemispheres. Be careful how you use those terms. Um, uh, on land, the highest temperatures normally occur four to six weeks after the summer solstice. Summer solstice is about June 21st. The warmest days of summer are usually mid-July for air over the continents, but oceans have more heat capacity and they take a longer time to warm up. So the warmer ocean temperatures occur almost three months after the summer solstice. 
The warmest ocean temperatures typically are in August, September, and October. And since the hurricanes need that, they need warm ocean temperatures, the hurricane season is then delayed that three months. So it's not midsummer or early summer, it's late summer and early fall because that's when the ocean sea surface temperature, SST is the abbreviation, abbreviation for sea surface temperature, is the highest. That defines the so-called hurricane season. Now remember, in the northern hemisphere, that is going to be um, July, August, September, and maybe a little bit in October. Um, whereas in the southern hemisphere, that is going to be, well, January, February, March, and April, right, in the southern hemisphere. That's their summertime, and that's when hurricanes are going to be most frequent in the, uh, in the southern hemisphere. They tend to drift uh, westward because they occur in the tropics under the influence of the trade winds. Uh, it's like you had a stream of water and you dip your hand in it and made a little vortex and you would watch and see that that vortex is just carried along by the stream. Whatever direction the stream is going in, that vortex would move as well. And that's um, primarily what's going on when a um, tornado is, when a hurricane is moving westward. However, it also has a poleward drift that can't be explained as simply as that. And that has something to do with the curvature of the Earth. I've published on this, but I don't have time to go through it. But there is a, there is a, uh, a drift of um, hurricanes towards the pole in both hemispheres. North Pole in the Northern Hemisphere, South Pole in the Southern hem Hemisphere that is added to that general westward drift due to being in the belt of the easterly trade winds. Okay, so um, these are the global hurricane tracks. It's, inter it's interesting for what is in this diagram and what's not in this diagram. For example, in the um, North Atlantic Ocean, the equator is about here, generally uh, hurricanes form in the central and sometimes even the eastern part of the tropical North Atlantic, and then they move westward and northward. So generally they follow a looping trajectory like this, or maybe they go straight into the Gulf of Mexico or through the Caribbean into the Gulf of Mexico like that. In the um, eastern tropical North Pacific, you have a very high density of um, hurricanes. Most of these don't uh, threaten land because they're going out to sea, but some of them that move up along the coast can threaten land. They don't go very far north because there's a cold California current that comes down here. Uh, I didn't put this in the notes, but you should write it down that uh, many people think there's a critical ocean temperature below which you cannot have hurricanes. And some people will tell you that's 27 degrees Celsius. Some people say it's 28 degrees Celsius. But somewhere about there is a critical ocean temperature. And uh, so the ocean has to be warmer than, let's say, 28 Celsius before it can support a uh, hurricane. And you don't have, have that up here because the cold Californ California current comes down. But closer to the equator, you do. Notice, right at the equator, no hurricanes. Plenty of warm water but no Coriolis force, so no hurricanes. Um, the western tropical North Pacific is a, a hotbed, the world's biggest hotbed of um, hurricanes. Be careful, though. Um, the word hurricane traditionally is not used in that part of the world. These are normally referred to as typhoons, after a Japanese word for hurricane. So it wouldn't be wrong to call these hurricanes, but it wouldn't be the vernacular. The vernacular would be typhoon. And um, so if I say there's a typhoon in the Western Pacific, you'll know I'm talking about a hurricane there. And they got the same kind of pattern as in the Atlantic. They go westward, but they also arc northwards. In the Indian Ocean, you get some. Um, in the Arabian Sea, in the Bay of Bengal, not many, but you do get some, and they can be quite damaging. In the southern hemisphere, look at this. You get them in the Indian Ocean. You get them in the west tropical Pacific. You don't get them in the east at all. And I would have said you don't get them in the 
Atlantic, but there was one about four years ago. It was the first ever reported hurricane in the tropical South Pacific, and they've got that one marked in here. Now, this is pretty easy to explain. There's a cold current. It's called the Humboldt Current, after a German explorer. A cold current that comes up along the coast of South America and floods this part of the, of the uh, southern eastward tropical Pacific. And therefore, the temperatures are not warm enough to support hurricanes. And pretty much the same thing is true here. There's a cold current that comes up along here. And um, while there is some warm air, right, some warm water right along the equator, there you don't have the Coriolis force. And here, you've got the Coriolis force, but the temperatures are too low. So you're not getting those two ingredients together, the warm water and uh, the Coriolis force. Questions on this diagram? Remember, these are not occurring simultaneously. This is in northern hemisphere hurricane season. These are in southern hemisphere hurricane season. We've just put them all together on one, on one diagram there. So here's the uh, a zoom in of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And um, you can see that many of them come so, so once a hurricane gets started, it's going to persist. It's a good, stable um, storm system. It'll persist until the conditions no longer make it possible. One of two things will happen. Um, it'll move over land, in which case it no longer has that water supply. Or it'll move over cold water, in which case it no longer has enough water supply, because the water can't evaporate fast enough from a, uh, from a, cold, from a cold ocean. Uh, typically, from the satellite, they look like this. They have a well-developed uh, large cloud shield. It's like a thunderstorm anvil, except it's kind of axisymmetric, things moving out in all directions. Um, and very often, but not always, there's an eye, which is a very peculiar characteristic. Uh, the air everywhere else is rising, but right there, the air is sinking. I know that because it's clear of clouds. Clear of clouds means sinking air thermodynamically. Underneath this, you can't see it, but the winds are strong in the, uh, cyclonic, in the cyclonic direction. So here's kind of a cartoonish cross section. Um, you've got these rain bands. The rain is not uniform in a hurricane, but forms in these spiral, heavy raining bands. Um, the air rises in this main eye wall and then spreads out in this giant anvil. First, it's still moving in the cyclonic direction. When that air moves far enough out, the Coriolis force acts on it and actually reverses its sense of direction. So be careful. If you're looking at movies of hurricanes, you may find that the outer clouds are actually moving uh, anticyclonically. Don't be confused. All the rest of the storm is still a tight, uh, cyclonically spinning uh, vortex. And then a little bit of that air that rises in the eye wall sinks right down in the eye and keeps that little section clear of clouds. Most of it, however, spreads out in this giant anvil whose diameter is several hundred kilometers across. So hurricane damage, of course, wind impact on buildings and vegetation. Remember that the pressure that a wind exerts on a surface is proportional to the square of the wind speed. So if you have a, a 10 meters per second wind hitting my house, that produces a certain force. If you have a 20 meters per second, that's four times, twice the speed, but four times the pressure force pushing on the house, and so on. So if you have a hurricane that's um, 60 meters per second or 120 meters per second, the, uh, the destructive forces of that push really go up very, very steeply and can destroy uh, uh, most buildings unless they're specially designed to be hurricane secure. Another thing is that storm surge, the, the rapid air movement across the surface of the ocean pushes water towards the shore and will give an apparent rise in sea level. We talked about this when we were discussing Irene. And uh, if you're standing on the beach, the water just suddenly seems to rise and move inland. On top of that, there's going to be the waves caused by the winds as well. 
But that storm surge is often responsible for some of the major damage. Inland flooding as well, and we saw that in Irene. Poor Vermont and New Jersey to some extent too had a lot of rainfall uh, which collected quickly into the valleys and rivers and caused a lot of flooding. Um, of course, for many people here in Connecticut, the main impact of Hurricane Irene was losing their electrical power for days. And that's mostly in this part of the world because the wind will take down a tree limb and wipe out most in this country, most of our power lines are above ground. Okay, it's cheaper to do that, easy to maintain in most cases, but they're so vulnerable to uh, tipping trees. So when you get a high wind event like this, trees come down, hit the wires, you lose, you lose both communication and power. In other parts of the world, um, hurricanes are often followed uh, a few weeks later by, by enormous loss of life from disease. For example, if you have a hurricane hitting Bangladesh or some of the other uh, undeveloped countries, what you'll have, uh, the hurricane will be finished and it'll be long gone and then, um, but people will be displaced from their homes and more importantly, water sources get mixed, right? So sewage gets into drinking water typically. And then disease begins and in the weeks and months that follow, you could have hundreds, thousands, even, t even tens of thousands of deaths arising from the quote hurricane, but it really has to do with just contamination of water supplies and a lack of a public health service to be sure that that sort of thing doesn't happen. So this is the biggest loss of life from hurricanes by far, uh, but these other things are important as well. <coughs> Any questions on that? So um, the most famous hurricane in New England was nicknamed the Long Island Express, 1938, had a track like this uh, and uh, hit Connecticut directly. A lot of damage along the Connecticut coast, even more along the Rhode Island coast. The hurricane produces its biggest, biggest damage on the right front quadrant, right? So it's got four quadrants based on how it's moving. It's that right front quadrant. Uh, that tends to have the strongest winds, in many cases the heaviest precipitation. And in this case, that hit Rhode Island and caused a lot of damage there. You can, if you Google Hurricane 1938, that one will pop up and you can read all about it. It really was a major event and it's still talked about today in Connecticut. We had our own chance at this just a few weeks ago. Hurricane Irene had a track similar to that, but not exactly the same. The difference probably was that it brushed ashore here near Cape Hatteras and lost a lot of its strength before it hit New England, partly by its lack of water vapor over the land and also the frictional, uh, with all the trees and so on over land, that friction weakened it. So by the time it hit us, it had uh, weakened to a category two or perhaps even one. And um, it still caused a lot of flooding damage, but not so much wind damage and, and other things. And then, of course, the, the most damaging hurricane in our country's history was Hurricane Katrina in August of 2005, and it had a different track. It started here in the eastern, well, just north of Cuba, uh, crossed over the southern tip of, of Florida, regained its strength, and then uh, hit uh, uh, New Orleans, and you can read all about that in the history books now in the history books now too. And there's a picture of Katrina just as it was about to hit New England, uh, hit the New Orleans of a beautifully formed storm with a beautiful central eye and uh, you know the cloud shield and the whole the whole business. Very strong storm that hit hit um, hit uh, New Orleans. This is the uh, what I mentioned before. There's a well-defined hurricane season. And uh, here it is for the for Atlantic hurricanes. And of course, when I say Atlantic, I'm referring to North Atlantic, because remember, there are no hurricanes in the South Atlantic. So this is the Northern Hemisphere um, hurricane frequencies for the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, typically, the frequency uh, is non-negligible even in June, but it begins to rise quickly at the 1st of August, peaks in early, mid-September, and then you're kind of out of the woods by the time you get to the beginning or the middle of 
November. And this all has to do with ocean surface temperatures. Questions on that? Yes. Well, it is, um, we have five minutes to go, but I, rather than starting a new subject, why don't we call it quits today and um, we'll do mid-latitude frontal cyclones on Friday.